Hello and welcome to Crisis What Crisis. I'm Andy Coulson, former newspaper editor, Downing Street Director of Communications and one time inmate of HMP Belmarsh. Over the last six years, I've put all of my experience, the good and the bad, to use as a strategic advisor to business leaders. And I can tell you that the bad has been just as useful as the good. And that got me thinking that there are plenty of great podcasts out there where you can hear stories of success, but there are far fewer where you can benefit from the experiences of those whose lives have properly unraveled. So on this podcast, you'll hear from the embattled and stoic, the shamed, courageous, ruined, damaged, unlucky and lucky survivors of crisis, all talking in the hope that they might serve as a useful guide to anyone facing down their own demons and challenges. Crisis What Crisis is generously supported by Mindstream, a brilliant company who harness the power of music for personal well-being and improving human performance. Just search Mindstream, that's Mind with a Y, on Spotify, and you'll find some great playlists. There isn't an introduction I can give to this week's guest that does her justice, frankly. Uh, I suspected that before we recorded our conversation, and I certainly feel it even more strongly as I sit here now trying to summarise the conversation we've just had. Nimco Ali is a British woman who has faced down the most difficult of personal crises and with a determination and the most astonishing single-mindedness, um, she's put them to work for a positive end. Nimco is just extraordinary. Um, as a six-year-old, whilst on holiday from her home in Manchester with her Somali grandparents, she found herself caught quite literally in the crossfire of a civil war, forced to flee with her brothers, but unable to return to the UK. She, for a time, was a child refugee living you know, in fear of her life from one day to the next. But then, just about a year later, and after finding safety, she was forced to undergo the brutality of FGM, that it was organised and encouraged by her own mother, as is so often the case with FGM, well, that just provided another layer of terror and confusion for this incredibly bright young girl. Um, what followed was a serious physical illness, a complication caused by the FGM, and ongoing psychological struggles that left all manner of other mental scars. But these uh, childhood crises that Nimco faced turned out to be the fuel for a remarkable adult life as a campaigner and activist, um, putting aside threats and intimidation from her community and relatives. Nimco has become a voice for the many millions of young girls who've undergone and still undergo FGM. As she puts it, they thought they were silencing me with FGM, but in fact, they were making me the loudest voice in the room. With her own story, which you're about to hear, um, she's proved beyond doubt that from horror can come hope, can come power, um, that she counts uh, a sense of humour as one of her most effective crisis tools, also hints at the unique and powerful way she has approached her life. My sincere thanks to Nimco Ali OBE, and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Nimco, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. Thank you for joining us. Um, you're, you're an FGM survivor. You were for a time in your life a child refugee. You faced the most appalling challenges in your life, and yet you describe yourself as privileged. H how, how do you reach that conclusion? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think it's just through the lived experience and actually seeing people, because there are 200 million women globally living with the consequences of FGM. And as we've known from the Syrian war and other wars that are going on in, in, in the world, there's never been more refugees or more displaced people in the world than there, that, than there is at the moment. Mm. So I think it's consistently looking at what's going around me and actually also understanding that, like, you know, that I am lucky the most. And in terms of the fact that I think the reason why I've been able to kind of bounce back the way I have been able to, to a certain extent, it's because of the privileges that I was um, born into and I had at the time. I think it also speaks to your uh, you know, incredible ability to sort of look for the positive in life. And I, and I want to get into that in a bit more detail uh, later, if, if, if we may. Your name, Nimco, means you know, blessing, gift from God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it perhaps, it perhaps gives a clue as to what your parents were feeling when you were born in Somaliland in, in 1982, I think. 
Yeah. What what do you what do you remember about your your early childhood? Um, I think it was the fact that I was treated as a blessing, not just by, by my parents, but my grandparents as well. So I'm the eldest daughter of the eldest daughter from, from my mum's side. So ultimately there was a lot of love and a lot of um, ce- celebration around my birth and my actual existence. And that's something that I've kind of, it kind of gave me the foundation to be able to feel as like, you know, as, as special as I do sometimes, because of the fact that there was a lot of love in that space. Wow. So you you look back on those very early years as a foundation then, really, yeah, you think, so you think, because I'm interested in talking about that today, uh, where, where with your, you know, kind of uh, 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 such challenges in your life, you, you see it clearly as right from the get go, there were foundations being laid as to as to how you would then cope with those challenges. Yeah, no, definitely. I was, um, I don't talk about it a lot and it's not something that is very much kind of um, seen in terms of the context with the, like an African family, but there was a lot of love in the way that I was raised. And also as a girl, I think I had, I had two, I had two uncles who were of, of, of similar age to me. So my mother and my grandmother ultimately both got married young and had me young. So my mother had me when she was 20. Mm. So we had younger brothers who were just just turning into double digits at the time when I was born myself um so like you know 10 11 12 um so ultimately in a space where there was meant to be a patriarchal kind of context in a way that that that, that families were raised I had a grandfather from my mom's side who was one of the only men who wasn't polygamous in his kind of marriage and who basically treated both his boys and girls um equally yeah you you, you mentioned there you grew up uh, your family was sort of split if you, know, you split your time between your maternal grandparents, I think I'm right in saying in Somaliland, and your paternal grandparents in Manchester. Yeah, so basically it wasn't my paternal grand. Um, so it's my maternal grandparents lived in Somaliland, and and my dad had family in Manchester, and he also worked in Jib- um he worked in um, Dubai. So ultimately it was a split between the fact that um, the UK, um, Dubai and Somaliland, but the most of formative years were either spent in the UK or with um, or, or in Somaliland. Right. And your dad, a successful guy, right? I mean, he was in, in the oil industry. Um, can you tell us a bit about your relationship with him? Um, you know what I loved, like, you know, I didn't see my dad as often as like, you know, she wasn't um, as stable in our lives in the sense that he was materially. So we had the, we had the trapping of, of, of a family father who had a really important job, but he was also someone that was just like basically in and out of our lives. And it was similar to that for my grandfather as well, my maternal grandfather, he ran um, massive hotels in what, what um, in Mogadishu, which is the capital of Somalia. Mm. So it was very much um, accepted that in order for you to be able to live the privileged life, the men were never really around because they were working. And you kind of, and that, and that was kind of like, you know, the way that love was expressed through like, you know, um, through material gifts and trappings that, that, that you had. So you knew you had a father and you were loved because you could have the house and, and, and the education and the trips that you were given. Yeah. But your grandfather is interesting. Your grandfather sounds as though he was actually, in his way, a pretty progressive. He, he was, yeah, he was massive. Yeah, he was massively progressive. And he was basically, I think he's been the fundamental um, kind of um, arc, like, you know, anchor in my life in, in terms of what, what men are. And he's the one that really actually has raised me that I kind of look to in terms of like, you know, what real men and what real feminism looks like within the male um, kind of context and also what, what real African leadership is. Okay. In late uh, 1988, uh, you're staying with your grandparents in, in Hargeza when you're her grandfather is uh, is arrested or yeah. is sort of seized, accused uh, effectively of supporting a revolution against um, the the military regime. Um, you're there when that happens. So tell me what you remember. Yeah, that's again. That's when that, that's when basically everything kind of just um, fell apart essentially. So I remember when they came, and my mother was away at the time with 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 my father in Abu Dhabi. So um, it was just it was me, myself, my sister, and my brother that was with my grandmother and my uncles and stuff like that. So they came in the middle of the night, and I and I remember him being dragged out. That was kind of like the Wednesday, and then by the Thursday and the Friday, there was like public announcements that these men were going to be executed, and everybody should be Stay, is, is, is staying home under house arrest and like you know basically not, not not taken to the streets and it wasn't just my grandfather it was all the men who kind of financially supported the revolutionary um army that was fighting for the independence of um of Somaliland which is the birthplace um where, where I come from 
basically they weren't going to execute my fa- my 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 grandfather and these men right now because they were basically going to keep them as pawns in order to be able to get the um, SNM, which is the Somali National Movement, to basically back down. They were like, well, if you don't back down, they will basically kill you. They were held as a threat. Yeah. They were held as a threat. So then the next thing was to basically um, get the sons of these men and my my eldest uncle, who is who is basically the third eldest in the family was in Canada, was in Canada at the time at boarding school. So he was kind of technically safe. Um, but, my, but my two young uncles weren't. So there was a decision made um, with my mother that they were going to come back to us in the UK. So they were very much hidden. Um, we went from my grandparents' house to a, um, to a school nearby where basically the, the family congregated. And then we were meant to make our way from, um, from Hergesa and then travel to Djibouti. And we had to uh, smuggle my um two uncles out and in this kind of instant we'd assume that my grandfather had been executed because we like you know the fact that this was the kind of propaganda that was going there but like i was saying because i'd been raised in this kind of more um emotionally intelligent kind of way which fear was a reality for me having lived in the west and having lived in dubai and stuff when the shelling was happening i don't know where my grandmother got this um um, architectural idea but she said like you know as soon as the shelling was happening she would she and we said to stand in the corners of the room so we'd all stand in the corner and so my brother Mohammed who is now like you know a father and a, and a grown man was about three or four like three or four at the time my sister was five I was six so we were so so, so, so we were all very tiny in that kind of um in, in in that kind of sense and I remember like you know I was the only one that was screaming saying I don't want to die and it became, it became it became a kind of a joke afterwards. And everybody's like, oh, I can't believe how much Limco loves her life. And I just, just think, of course I live my life. I don't I don't want to like, yeah. like there are bombs going off. I don't want to die. It's actually not as like, you know, not as strange as it seems for a child to say when when, when you're a six year old girl at this stage. Right? Yeah, when the when basically like, you know, as soon as like, you know, dust like, you know, as soon as it got dark, that like, you know, basically the bombings would just happen. And I was just thinking like this is just like um crazy. But I mean the the, the point is that you, this wasn't a sort of slow slide towards this moment. There weren't there weren't sort of even days or weeks of preceding this horror. It no. was literally day one, you know, you're on holiday with your grandparents. Day two, you are immersed in, in this, well, civil it's, it's, it's just a, it's a civil war that, that one imagines as a six-year-old girl. How on earth can you begin to rationalise it and understand it exactly. with, bombs, with bombs exploding around your head? Yeah, no, no, definitely. And it was just like, it was, it was kind of weird because there was a, like, you know, I always felt there was a level of, like, you know, as soon as we, we got out of the house and the shelling would kind of stop, there was a level of security that I felt in my um, grandmother and we had to dress my two grand um, to my, my two uncles up as boys as we were like you know um, leaving the city to get to um, Djibouti. You flee the city then and you head to Djibouti to your yeah. aunt's home. How strong are those memories, uh, Nimco, of, of the journey? You know because it must have been uh, utterly terrifying. You're in the back of a truck. You've been hidden. It's it's through the night. I mean, how, how, what do you remember of that? I just, I just remember it just I, I it's 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 weird I was just like fed up I think that was my kind of thing was the fact that I was I was never happier or more keen to get back to Manchester and anything so I was just like extremely just fed up so we had um not just myself my, so it was my two uncles my two siblings my auntie my mum's um younger sister and then and then we also had my grandmother's sister and her kid how long was that journey I think it was like it was it was definitely a few days because we 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 stopped at like you know um, separate cities and as we were leaving the, as as we were leaving Hergesa, which is the capital, my mom was coming back in, and she was um um um, um heavily pregnant. And I remember like hearing her voice, and this is something that I told my grandmother. And my grandmother was like very much shocked that I even remember it because I was having a conversation with my brother in English because he said he wanted to go to the toilet, and I told him to shut up. There was no toilet. So my mum must have heard like kids speaking and she kept on, she called out my name and I said, I can hear my mum. And my granny just thought it was like wishful thinking. So she went back in. So she didn't mm. find us. And I didn't see my mother for like another week when she got to Djibouti. Right. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. So. That's just an appalling situation. I mean, when you, when you look at your, you know, your eventual resilience, you know, your resilience now, you know, okay. as a, as a, a, a astonishingly kind of strong woman. Do you think some of it was forged? We'll get on to, obviously, you know, uh, uh, the other events in your life. 
shortly. But when you look at those events, mm. that shock, do you think that that kind of forged some of the strength that you had later uh, when you had to confront other issues, but also, but also now do you, do you sort of look at it and think, actually that was, although I was only six, that was formative. It was, no, it's definitely formative and it's given me the, like, you know, the moral compass that I have essentially because my grandfather, even through all that stuff, never um, was ever spiteful or hurtful or actually ever really wanted any kind of um, um, revenge. And I think that's like, you know, in terms of the fact that he understood that what he did wasn't for greed or wasn't for power, but was for justice. So I think that's like, you know, it's kind of given me my kind of um, political neutrality in the sense where I always say, I never idolize anybody to the state where I can't criticize them. And I never dehumanize anybody to the point where I can't find any humanity for them. Yeah. So I like, so I learned that very much from my grandfather and very much from the people that were around me that it was so easy for um, hate to kind of consume my life within like one week I was running around irritating my uncle. And then the next we were basically in the back of a car and people wanted to kill him because of his bloodline. Um, so to be in that kind of um, different spaces within a split second, it's kind of, it's made me very much, more attuned to the way that people communicate yes. and the way that hate can, can sometimes come as like, you know, as a powerful tool beyond love. Um, beautifully put. Um, can we move on? Cause it really isn't that long after No, you were six when you're seven, uh, uh, you are confronting a, a different type of horror. Um, uh, can we talk about the day itself? Because the day you became a, a victim of, of of FGM, because as I understand it, you had a sort of sixth sense on that day. Yeah, it was just so it was there was there was a several months in between. So by the time we'd got to Djibouti, we were settling in, and because the um, all kind of Somali passports were cancelled, my mother had to we had to kind of fly, um, we had to kind of apply to come back to the UK as refugees, and so that was the process that was kind of going through. And the fact that, like, you know, as a six turn in a seven year, so I turned seven in that kind of time. So it was around, obviously, it wasn't until the next year that we left. So December had passed and, um, like, you know, at, like, you know, at least, like, you know, six, seven months that we were in um, um, Djibouti. Ultimately, the conversation was being had about the FGM, but I had no idea what it was. So in the sense that I knew what was like, there, were, there, there was some kind of um, celebration or ritual that was being, um, that was being um, kind of um, planned. And it was more essentially from the context of the fact that these kids are never going to come back to this country. So therefore they're going to live in a Western society. So therefore how can we make them as Somali as possible is to, um, is to, it's to give them FGM. And if you think about like, I think about it right now, but that, that my mom was 27 at the time. And I had like, you know, I you know, started to have these conversations with her just in the latter, like, you know, three, four years since my grandmother um, has, has passed away. I think, like the level of like um, what's the word like you know consideration that that they took to make sure that the woman that would cut us would be the same woman that cut them who's who's ironically still alive. Um, really, because it was I the had, same woman. It's who, the same woman who, who like, carried out FGM mom, on your own yeah. mother. Right. And on my own mother was the same one, and they basically were like would not entrust it to anybody else. And I had no idea about all this stuff. It's just I remember like going to my go going around with my grandmother when she was organizing things and she's making the, like you know the food for the blessings and all these other kind of things so I was just like I was like I was kind of aware but I was a child as well there was no context into it sure. so when we basically had to um go and have a shower in the cell like about basically go cleanse ourselves before um before we had the FGM I, I didn't go to the bathroom I ran behind my grandmother and went to the door and then just saw this woman and I just thought she actually, because the, because the, because the nanny you used to tell us um, really like nightmare stories of women that came um, and kind of like you know kidnapped kids and like you know ate them and all this other kind of stuff. So I wasn't thinking she was gonna like do FGM. I just thought she was somebody that was gonna do something horrible um, to me. So I remember running out and running away, and and then I, I went to go find my cousin who was all, who was very Mancunian who was also stuck in this. Um, stuck in Djibouti and I was about to tell him what was going to happen and I was like you know this woman's going to eat me or whatever and, the, and then my mum was basically like I can't believe so then my mum came out of nowhere and basically like just grabbed me and took me back and she's like I can't believe that you were going to tell a boy 
what was going to happen. And I was just thinking, actually, I don't even know what is going to happen. I don't know what you guys are actually even um, um, talking about. So in that time, my sister, my, my younger sister, who was five at the time, had gone, had gone before me. And then I came back and then I got scolded by the woman by being called a brat and saying, do you know how, um, how hard it is to find um, like, you know, any kind of like an you know, antiseptic and all these things so during the middle of a war and look at me running away and not being grateful. So, and I remember it was, it wasn't actually the physicality and the, the pain of the FGM. It was also this whole thing of just being like chastised for actually not wanting something horrible to happen to me, which I just found like immensely confusing. Goodness, and, and and from this distance, you are now uh, you now think that probably this was happening to an awful lot of girls at the same time in the same place, almost because yeah. of this because of this panic that that they may never be able to families panic that they may never be able to bring you back to have had that FGM later in your life. It's actually like the level of money and privilege that are my side of the family and these people had in order to be doing these kind of things and to, yes. use, and to yes. use stupidity it's just like it's actually just it's just like astounding and that's, and that's Stup- really stupidity on one side and the kind of obsession that of its importance and the need to do it despite its obvious cruelty yeah no definitely and, and, that's, is, and that's basically and that's basically what ended up happening as well when we came back to the uk um like a lot of a lot of the kind of um, Somali parents who were here already got freaked out that there was going to be more and more Somalis in the country. So therefore, their daughters who were born here or was here or were here as kids would be judged. So I remember in the nineties, um, um, like you know, my mum, like I don't, it was it was a very open secret. So one of the women was like, "Oh my god, like where, where, where are you going to get Nimco and so and so done?" And she's like, "No, I did it before I came." And she was like, "Oh my god, you're so lucky." So, so there was girls being taken from Manchester, from Cardiff, to like to to basically to be cut around the country in the UK. And then when things ended up settling down into the mid '90s, they were being taken to Dubai. So it was a very open secret, and it's this very it was kind of like a duty that women had to do in order to prove that they were raising their daughters well. I always say that my FGM happened out of context because I had I had this horrific horrific act happen to me, but then nobody talks about it afterwards, and none of the other kind of gender conformity stuff of like girls being quiet and sitting down and all these things actually whatever I was never instructed in that kind of way so I was yes I was I was I I was allowed to be very like you know open and questioned and kind of live in a way where the FGM physically happened but there wasn't any other kind of condition condition that I have so literally I bounced back from just like what the hell was this to basically just running around with my uncles and my cousins um, um, again and just kind of thinking I just can't wait to get back I just can't wait to get back um um, back to um, the, um, the UK to be as much as a normal child or to actually be able to have a conversation with somebody who wasn't in a, in a mental crisis every single moment. Because I think that yes. was the main thing was that everybody, else, like, you know, as much as I do think the world revolves around me, it definitely was not revolving around me at that time. But what had happened to you was literally kind of, there was, there was a day before, there was the day it happened and then, and then it was kind of, right, on, on we go. Yeah, basically. Was, well, basically uh, and no context either side. To be, to be, to be, yeah. to, um, to be fair, there were like, like you know, really painful rituals that were kind of like, you know, in, 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 in the sense because the FGM that I had was a very physical and very invasive form where they basically snitched like in, they in fibrillation. They, yeah, yeah infibulation. So, so they um, stitched anatomy together. So there was like at least a week and um, plus of me, like you know, having to urinate every hour and kind of being like you know, having my legs kind of tied together. But after that, it was just kind of like basically off you go kind of thing it wasn't um now that now now that now now that you've been cut you have to act differently there was like there wasn't any of the other kind of stuff and for, for all the other girls that i've known and i've known since like you know their life did change after they had fgm they basically became a little bit more um kind of kept in the house and had to kind of start acting in a completely different way yeah i mean i'm just trying to which is impossible to do i'm trying to marry this idea of you you know, Nimico named as, you know, literally named as a blessing. And then this, you know, sort of barbarism in your, in your life. Um, And I know it's, it's, it's so complex because in the end it comes down to, you know, your relationship with your mother, but, but how do you now, because I know you have reached sort of a point of peace about it. 
How did how did you get there? It took a long time in order for me to be able to make sense of it. But in in like you know through the kind of the last stages of my grandmother's life, I ended up like really understanding like you know how little power that my mother had about the issue of FGM but mm-hmm. how much power she had over everything else so I in the sense again coming back to the position of privilege I, I have been raised in a sense where I was freely educated I went to a church of England school I like you know mixed very openly with um, non-Somali children I was like you know so I've been in a position where the fact that I was never kind of like you know put in a cultural um, space for the fact that this is how girls act and this is how you're meant to be doing. I'm now being able to educate, being able to be educated and able to make my own money. I think that was something that my mother could never do. So my mother was raised to marry a wealthy man and to, to have those, to have those, to, to, to be able to be put in that position, you have to have FGM, you have to be in a certain way, you have to kind of behave yes, and yes. be like, you know, so, so, so for her, it was kind of like the, the product of what it actually, like, you know, what are the, what are the pillars of being a Somali woman was to have FGM. It was as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. To have these kind of, to have these kind of markings. And there was nobody there that actually really asked these questions of, of why. So I remember when everybody used to tell me when I was growing up, when, when I was like, when people would talk about FGM and say, this was an act of love. I was like, it was an act of love. It was an act of fear mm. and an act of like, you know, an act of ignorance because my mother did not know what, like whether the earth was round or flat for a woman who was not cut and being able to be married and how is she going to, be able to live in that kind of um, um, society. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think she could project 30 years later, I'd, I'd, um, I'd be able to rent my own place and have my own bank account. Sure. Yeah. yeah. At 11, you fell quite badly ill, very seriously yeah. ill as a result of the FGM, uh, yeah. the, an infection that spread to your kidneys. And you underwent a, a de-infibulation, uh, which becomes a sort of matter of shame in and of itself, because that is not supposed to happen until you're much older and presumably when you're at the age when you can approach marriage. Yeah. How did that um, How did that sort of shame show itself in the community? How do you re- How do you remember that, and how did you react to that? It was actually quite well. It's funny in 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 the sense that what I do now and what happened at that time because I remember my mum being over my bed as I came as I came to when I was at home. Like so, not when I was in the hospital. When I was in the hospital, I was the nurse was the first person that I saw, and I just thought to her like, you know, are you actually going to have a conversation with me about what happened? Because like I've been trying to describe this thing for years and years, mm. but ultimately you've actually seen it. So can we have a conversation? Um, um, about that but she, obviously she wasn't gonna she, she wasn't in a position to do it but then I remember like you know go, go, go going back home and my mum um basically put me in her bed which was always an act of kind of like when we were unwell and stuff like that we would sleep in my mum's bed but I remember waking up and my mum saying you can't tell anybody that you've had a de fibrillation and I, and I remember looking at her thinking why would I talk to anybody about my vagina well, 20 years later, I'm doing that a lot. But at the time, I just like, why would I, why would I even do that? Why? So it was very much like, you can't tell anybody that you're now kind of, um, that, that, that you're kind of like now um, open. Right. And essentially it was, that, she wanted it to be your secret, essentially. Yeah, it has to be your secret. And then, and then, and then I think the kind of the way that the, um, the way that um, the shame kind of manifested itself or kind of like hit, um, hiding the secret from like others, as though like, you know, as a Somali woman, I'm not, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe they were, but, but, but listening to you going to the toilet, like, you know, the whole point is like, because I could, I could urinate more freely that would like you know if, if anybody heard that then they would know that I was like you know that I wasn't stitched up so I would literally flush the toilet before I went to the toilet or I'd put like toilet paper down or whatever Good so God. the idea the idea of actually making any noise when you go to the toilet was actually something that was, like, you're, 11, you're an 11 year old girl yeah and that's where that's the way you're policed and I just I used to think and I used to sit there the older I got um as um as people in the public sector and my child protection and stuff like that I was like do you understand how weird it is that people are so fascinated about a child anatomy do you not find this extremely strange mm. and nobody seemed to find that strange because we were brown people and brown people weren't judged the same as like white people were in terms of their the way that they react to children and their anatomy exactly this is what i want to ask you about because one of the most shocking aspects of, of fgm i think to people listening to this is that in many ways it's a sort of horror in plain sight yeah that for girls who suffer in this country you know, more, too often a, a blind eye is taken. And that happened to you with teachers. Yep. It happened to you with doctors in that hospital, presumably. Definitely. No, uh, when, you, when, you, when you came back to the UK, it yep. was seen as a, kind of, as a kind of cultural thing that we shouldn't get involved in. 
Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, definitely. It was seen as an other. And I think in terms of um, the teachers and stuff like that, I can, I, can, I can see why a seven-year-old being very graphic about something that happened to her was like shocking and like, you know, she probably, but the idea, the fact that this is a medical intervention, like, you know, like, the, like the medical yeah. like institutions intervened and they saw that like, you know, that I almost died because of this, but nobody actually said anything. I think for me, that was, that was like, you know, that was very dramatic um, or like, you know, it was very kind of painful and it really did kind of um, hurt a lot in order for me to be consistently dismissed and, and also like when, when, um, when certain people were, were brave enough to be able to question as to whether they were midwives or act like, you know, or kind of social workers in basically Cardiff, essentially when I, where I was, they were told that they were actually stigmatizing the community. You're an 11 year old girl, but you're clearly a very bright 11 year old girl. You're telling them, right? Yeah. It, you're, 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 you're doing your best to explain what happened to you. You did not sort of, you didn't keep that secret that your mum wanted you to keep. You would, you would try to explain what had happened yeah. and, and, and how you felt and the pain that you were in. And yet, and yet heads sort of turned away from you. Yeah, it was, and also it was, it was, it was the, the, the thing, it was that tilted kind of thing of they understood, they, they knew it was wrong, but they were like, well, we can't really do anything. If they said, I don't care, that's like, you know, that's weird and go away. But it was this whole thing of the fact that they knew it was horrible, they knew it was bad, but they weren't going to do anything about it. So I think that cultural relativism was something that was massively problematic and it still kind of carries on in, in, in the way that we're kind of consistently always othering mm. um, women of colour especially and really looking at their humanity, like not giving them the same level of respect and humanity that we give other mm. people. It's more than that though, isn't it? Because it was illegal. Yeah. It was, it's it, illegal since 1985. And and do you know what the people like it was it was illegal to do it here in the UK. So therefore, when they got smart about the law, they were taking girls out to Djibouti and uh, not by, um, to Dubai mm. and, and other places. Like there was there was very little ignorance of the law. Um, like you know when FGM was happening, and even to this day, right now, it's just like it's really bizarre. Like I meet I meet people all the time who are like basically telling me that we shouldn't be prosecuting people because they, they don't know it's illegal. And I was thinking, how can you not know it's illegal when you... And I, so I said to a Somali guy once, he had this argument with me saying, I can't believe that you want to lock pe people up, um, but they don't know it's illegal. They need to be educated. So I said to him, I, I said, do, do you drive? And he said, yes. And I said, do you know where to park and where not to park? Um, and he said, yes. And I said, well, if you can understand the basic civility of parking in this country, then you know that mutilation of a child is actually wrong. So mm. like this idea of the fact that you don't know holding a child down and cutting the anatomy is illegal when you know that you're not doing that in like in like in open sight and telling teachers about it. So yeah. Yeah. so like ethnic minorities love to play the ignorance card and like you know um white people that feel guilty let them get away with it. Yeah. Let's talk about that sort of period in between um you know 11 let's say 12 and, and when eventually you kind of start to talk about your story, which is much later, so it's a fairly large, you know, part and very important part of your of your life as you're becoming a young woman. How are you? How are you dealing with it at that stage, Imiko? What's your, you know, you're a you're a you're a super bright, very ambitious, you know, young woman. You go to university. Uh, you you then you know decide that you want to be a civil servant you enter the fast track in the civil service but during during that whole period how how are you dealing with this if you put it in a if you put it you know in a, in a corner of your mind not not to deal with or are you s slowly beginning to kind of understand what happened to you what's the sort of process that you're going through and how are you coping yeah so i was like um so I, like you know again i kind of um i i kind of checked out of the Somali community and people that were around me from the, from, 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 and from the age of like, you know, um, 13, 14, because I was having a conversation with all these girls saying like, this stuff is wrong. And, and, and I was like, again, like, again, I keep using the word lucky, but I was also, again, in that sense, I was privileged that I even, that, that I was able to have all my kind of, um, I was able to start menstruating when, when I had my deep fibrillation. So I'm the deep fibrillation at 11 meant that I had like, you know, a semi-normal anatomy in terms of like, you know, there was mm. very little complications. So for me, it was just kind of like, I, I, I kind of, I thought I put this at the back of my mind, but at the same time, because I was so emotionally scarred by this whole thing, I like, you know, ended up developing an, an eating disorder at 14, which would kind of like, you know, stay with me for the next, um, um, like, you know, um, like, you know, 15 to 20 years. Did you get any help for your eating disorder? No, it, no, I didn't. I didn't actually, I didn't actually kind of, 
check into um, or therapy or start having conversations until a lot later in life, which is kind of like recently because in that sense, um, otherwise it was just, they were, they, they were just very much me, myself and I, and I wish I'd actually done a little bit more about it because even when I got into activism, like, you know, that, that the eating disorder again took that kind of like um, heightened step because again, I was dealing with the same kind of like, you know, backlash and issues I dealt with when I was a child. I was questioning this um, kind of issue. But Nimco, how are you doing this? You know, I mean, how are your people listening to this? I'm, I'm sure they feel the same way as I do. They're just sort of, a bit, you know, full, obviously full of s- s- sympathy even from, from this distance. It's just the most appalling story. But how are you, you know, the, what, what's the, what, what is it about you that is, that is able to kind of, kind of, you know, drive through these things? I mean, it's an astonishing strength that you have. I do, I do you know what I think I like, you know, I, and I'm not like, you know, I'm not as religious as like a lot of people, but I think it is that kind of, I think I, I, I realize that I'm not the most like, you know, I, I just don't take myself seriously. I think yeah, you can feel like, you know, you can feel sorry for yourself and you can kind of like, you know, suck up and kind of do things. But I, I guess it's been a Capricorn as I, as, I, as I like to tell my niece, that's how I kind of, I think that's the only thing that can really explain um, my kind of, um quirky ways um essentially but i but i also think i think like loving my grandfather understanding him and having a passion for history i think i think i think history in, in terms of things that really kind of um spoke to me and academia was something that was very much that like, gave me kind of um comfort essentially gave you comfort because it gave you a wider arc in which to understand yeah and also what, what the, the things that had happened to you yeah, and really understand that, like you really, know, you were able to sort of step back from your own personal experience and um, and place it in a sort of timeline that you could then begin to rationalise. And yeah, and understand that there's people that came before me that had like you know crazy things that um kind of um, um happened to them, and also ultimately I think finding I think both there were two formative writers in my childhood. It was George Orwell and um and and like you know um. And at the Salawi, um, so there was this Egyptian writer, um, Noel at the Salawi, who, who basically also wrote about her own um, kind of FGM. And I, I read her book, like her essay about FGM around 13 years old. So this was, again, right. when I kind of like did the checking out and kind of like stopped being so vocal about the issue. Of this, I've been, and, then, and then reading, actually, like, you know, reading 1984 on Animal Farm also mm. kind of made me like you know realize that I wasn't mad in kind of thinking that I was the only person that might be sane in this whole world on one side I've got my this the Somali community that thinks this brutal act is okay and then on the other side I've got the western society which is knows it's not okay but I'm saying nothing about it and I just thought in that kind of conversation I'm thinking actually you know what I'm not that crazy thinking that these people are wrong so it's um, but the, one of the one of the there are so many analysts but but one of the you know, one of the most upsetting elements is the idea that you're alone through all this. No, definitely. And that's you know, at, what, at, what point, at what point did you, I want to talk about the moment when you, as I understand it, almost accidentally told the story publicly for the first yeah. time. I want to talk about that in a second. But before then, you know, to be able to do that, I suppose, before then, when was the moment when you stopped uh, feeling alone? Do you know what? In this journey, I don't think I've like you know I've, I've I've always been, and this is the thing that my history teacher used to say: um, Planet Nimco, Population One, come back to Earth. Because I'd always be like thinking in a completely different kind of mm. um, a kind of way, and I've been very comfortable in that space of actually maybe being the only person who might be right in a certain situation or, or think something in a certain kind of way. I don't have an opinion about everything. I have, I have opinions about things I'm informed on. So even when I said the idea of like ending FGM and people are like, are you mental? Like, what are you talking about? This is a 4,000 year practice that's never going to end and nobody cares. I was like, do you know what? I think they will. And it was just that whole kind of never taking myself too seriously, but also being a firstborn in a sense that, I'm just going to keep saying what I'm saying and then we kind of get to it. So I think, I think that's like, you know, I, I, I you know, that's for me, I think the reason why I get, like, I, I am a complete loner in that sense. Like, you know, I know a lot of people, there are people um, around me, but I am a complete loner and I'm okay in that space. And I'm also okay to take the mick out of myself. I don't take myself seriously, even yeah. like, yeah. 
even when I'm doing like a series of jobs, like the most important jobs and stuff like that. I think that's why, that's why I've also been very able to um, hang out with very like, you know, powerful people because I'm just like, get over yourself. Like, <laughs> like you're not that important, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I think it might be rude. Actually, I'm starting to think. No, it's, I'm right. You know, I'm, 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 that's absolutely. It's got to be. We need more of that in public life. Um, look, let's just let's just go, go to that moment when you do talk about um, your FGM for the first time publicly. Um, you, in 2010, you'd moved from Bristol to London. Yeah. Uh, you started volunteering for a charity that worked with girls who'd, who'd undergone uh, FGM. Uh, and one of the girls you met there invited you to an art exhibition, as I understand it. She was yeah. holding um, about her experiences. And uh, when she's on stage, she freezes. You're, you're there, presumably in the audience, and she, and, she, and she freezes. And you take it upon yourself to go on to the stage to help her through, to try and persuade her to, 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 to kind of continue with, her, continue with her talk. And in doing so, uh, uh, you, you start to explain to her what your experience was. Not yeah. realizing, not realizing that that, that you were both uh, effectively on on the microphone, that you were effectively mic'd up. Is that correct? Yeah, no, and it was and it was also my second date with my first ever white boyfriend. So I decided I was going to start dating white men. It was just, right. Actually, you know what? It was really interesting because I ended up like sign. I moved to London um, and I and I ended up signing on for Match. dot com because I thought nobody talks to me in bar pubs. I don't drink, so I was like. So it's like, how can I get like, you know, it's like, so I remember saying to that, that boyfriend of mine who ended up like staying in my life for a while, I said, oh, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. I said, I like, just very narrowed it down. I was like, I need to like, you know, I think there's only two people I really get along with is like Somaliland men or white English posh boys. So I need to find like, you know, where, can I, <laughs> where can I, where, where can I find them? Right. And I remember registering and putting it on my credit card and that credit card being still sent to my house in Bristol and my mum, and my mum opening it. And being so horrified and like basically saying that being 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 on a dating side was akin to prostitution and i was like well it's actually not but whatever um so yeah so i was already kind of like you know having these kind of like little tips with 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 my mum and so on so essentially i went and i didn't want her to carry on i wanted her to feel better i wanted I wanted her, I, I really understood that in that moment that my silence was so complicit to the misunderstanding of, of, of what FGM was because that girl had never met anybody who had the same experiences that she did, who was okay. Mm. And like, you know, obviously I was still in the grips of like, you know, semi of my eating disorder, but at the same time I was okay as possible. I'd got a good job. I was like on a second date with this lanky um, boy. Um, so, when I, so when I saw her on that kind of platform, just like hyperventilating, I just thought, I took her aside and I just told her like, it, it really is going to be okay because I'd listened to her and, um, for months and months and spoke about it in, in the third person. Mm. I said like, you know, you're going to be okay. You're fine. You're like, you know, intimacy is the main thing when it comes to, um, when it comes to like be, 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 and, and being able to have sexual pleasure because they, they, there are always like random statements made by, um, about women who've, who've had FGM as though like, you know, Oh, women who've had FGM can't enjoy sex, or women of FGM can't do this, can't do that. This is how they feel. And I'm just thinking, actually, that's 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 that, that's not really true. Like every single um, woman has their own story, and every woman is different. And I think we need to be able to treat women as individuals. And I think that's one of the things that I was very much um, like, like gripped by the shame of not being seen as just a mutated vagina. Mm -hmm. And it was really, and it was really interesting. Like um, in tw in tw in 2014, I ended up meeting. Noel at the Salawi um, uh, um, at the South Bank Centre and I really wanted to ask her the conversation about her mum because she writes so like you know in her book she writes about the fact that but when she when she gets out of the grips of the cutter that the circumcise her she, she, um, um, she looks for her mum and she sees her mum cackling in the corner with these women who have been part of this abuse so I really wanted to ask her like you know um, what, how she re, 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 rebuilt her relationship with my mum because in 2014 my mum I, I, I didn't actually ever see a way of my mum and I ever re reconciled him mm. um, but, 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 um, but in that moment like in this, um, um, in, in this talk that she was doing she started talking about um, shame and, 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 and how she'd written the um, chapter which essentially changed my life four times ripped it up and thrown it into basically the Gulf of Aden and just kind of like, you know, just thrown it into the sea several times um, because she was just so embarrassed. And I said, to, so I said to her like, 
So I asked her, like, I've been waiting almost 20 years of my life to ask her about her mother and I asked her instead about, um, about what the shame that gripped her was. And she said, I'd be, I was a doctor, I was a political activist, I was all these things. I didn't want to be reduced on the international stage as just a nuclear vagina. And that was essentially the same thing that was keeping me talking about my own experience as well, because sitting around in these spaces, I would constantly hear people talking about and at women who had undergone FGM, not knowing there was um, one sitting there. And mm. that's why I just wanted to tell this girl, just to say, like, you know, I swear to you, it's all going to be okay. And, um, and like, you know, that I, I had FGM, I had type three, I had exactly what you had and you will be, a, and, and you will be okay. And the whole room was quite shocked, but I think there was nobody more shocked than the guy I was with at the time. So I had to take him home and start to consult, like, you know, basically help, help, um, help him through the fact that, yeah. like, you know, that he's like, you know, that the woman he might be dating is a survivor of FGM. But this is the moment when uh, your entire life changes. So every one of your relationships changes. Yeah. That you've decided that I'm not, I'm not going to, although you've done a tremendous amount of work already to support those who, who've been through FGM, you had, you'd kept your own story to, to yourself to that point. Yeah, so no, definitely. Huge kind of change in your life and, and, in, and in every one of your important relationships. No, definitely. I think that was like, you know, obviously that, that was the catalyst. And then I ended up doing um, an evening started article about a few months later, just to kind of talk about this, like, you know, to be the first, like, you know, to be the first person to talk about um, like the first instance of like just being a British girl that had FGM. Yeah. Um, and obviously I thought it's, it's the even standard, like, you know, it's only, it's only going to be read in London. Like, like, you know, that's fine. Nobody's going to really find out about it. But obviously um, it got picked up in Somalia and Somaliland and everywhere else. And within literally 48 hours, there were people like, you know, offering my brothers to, to like, you know, to basically take care of me because I brought this honor to the family. And that was really the first instance of where my brothers who were younger than me were for the first time spoken to as though they had some kind of power over me. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking like, he's my younger brother. How dare, like who, who would even think that he, like, you know, that he has the idea to be able to control my, um, and the way that I behave and stuff like that. But they'd kind of like, you know, associated the honor, um, of, 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 um, of, of my family around my brothers and I, so, and they, I just, so they said those things to your family did your what did your family say to you so when my brother was like com- like you know completely scared for me and my mother it was really interesting like my my mum my, my at the time wasn't as sympathetic like you know because I was thinking how are people threatening to um to do me harm and, and, and one of the people was like my cousin from my dad's side of the family and I was just thinking like and I was actually told I shouldn't tell the police on him because the, it's it's worse for him to be arrested than for him to threaten to kill me. And I was like, like no. So how was this? How was this manifesting itself? How were these threats manifesting themselves? Were they coming to you sort of secondhand, or or? or? They were definitely they were coming to me secondhand because they were basically going directly to my brothers and they were directly going to the family because therefore I was seen as an issue to talk to me directly because I'd been like you know I I dishonored the family it wasn't anything that they were gonna actually um, kind of do. Uh, and I remember, like, you know, when it kind of really um, took a hold, it was, um, um, I was coming, so, so, so my brother had called me because somebody had actually, like, you know, he was really scared for me. And I was going, and I, and I was going to his place and I was in an Uber and the Uber guy, or the, not, not Uber, Uber, like a taxi. And the taxi had taken, um, like, you know, a direction that I didn't know. And I literally, for a second, tried to jump out of a moving car because I thought this guy was going to, like, you know, um, this guy was going to um, murder me. And then I decided that I wasn't going to do any more press. Um, so that's like basically, I think it was like 2011, 2012, that when I, I thought I'm not doing any more press. And then yeah. I remember somebody from, from the Times coming to me and saying, should we have lunch and have a conversation? And I thought to myself, well, the Times is behind a paywall. So all these idiots that want to kill me are not going to want to buy the Times anyway. So I'll have a, I'll have a chat. And I remember it was like the 30th of January um, or 31st of January 2014 or... Um, and the guy so had this conversation with 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 the journalist and then she was like oh do you mind if we just take a picture and then basically the sky papers come up and there's my face on the front of the right front of the time saying i don't blame my mother i just think she did a stupid thing or did i call my mom stu-? i said the whole point is that the fgm was stupid i said she mm. wasn't a bad person it's just like and i just thought oh my god that's it like you know it's um and did that did that cause more pressure from yeah 
Yeah. It did. It did, and actually, it set it set up a kind of a um, kind of a sequence of events that actually was very interesting from the FGM activism world because what had happened was the fact that and that this same cousin of mine and somebody like an, that uncle of mine had spoken to the Times and said, "Do you have any evidence that the fact that she's had FGM? Like, can you prove it?" And then I got, and then I, and then I got the, and then I got the um, times to say like, can you prove you had FGM? And I was actually going to do it. And then I thought to myself, actually, that is like the most ridiculous thing that could play. Good. And, and then it was really interesting because because a lot of the work that I I do when I and like you know that I believe in is not about centering it around myself or around the issue and kind of doing that. It kind of just became this whole thing that a lot of the kind of the activists in this space were kind of thinking, well. She's a, she is she is only working in government, so maybe her FGM wasn't as FGM as we thought it was. And I was like, I just don't sit around all day crying about it. It's like it happened to me, like you know, it happened to me thirty-one years ago. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not, the, it's one of the, it's part of my life, but it's not the biggest part of my life, essentially. You have very clear views on 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 how this should be discussed, how it should be framed. You got very clear views on the words that should be used, right? That's very important to you. No, no, definitely, definitely. I think, like you know, so so the whole point is the fact that I, like you know, I, I, I really don't believe in the stigmatization of women who have already undergone FGM. So this idea of victim when you could be a survivor, and this idea of the fact that FGM has to define you for the rest of your life. Like people, like you know, well, especially in the, in the international development states, want you to consistently be broken. And I was, like you know, when I was getting so much, like you know vile um stuff from both online and from from everywhere i was broken and i was broken before that when i had my eating disorder and as a child trying to figure things out but ultimately i'm a survivor and i survived those things and i want women to know that they're survivors and one of the things i've never never wanted to do was to be was 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 to be disrespectful of survivors and i think that's like something that i'm very much passionate about and if that means taking on massive institutions I think that's what like you know that is what I've just done it hasn't like you know necessarily been the easiest of past but yes. what I think we're on the right side of history on yes so when we ask you the question then of, of how you how you got through this and how you get through this it's, it's that single-mindedness that you've described but also it's that refusal to be defined by it yeah, no, definitely, definitely. It's like I'm, 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 I'm many things, and FGM is something that happened to me. It's not something that defines me. So, I've like you know, I've had several things um, happen to me. I think the, what kind of um, defines me is like I think I think my, my sense of humor and my my ability to kind of get on with it. I think is more a characteristic of who um, of, of, of of who I am rather than the FGM itself. Um, can we just talk very quickly about? Um sort of FGM in a UK context. Obviously, we touched on it in terms of when you came back, um, that kind of turning the blind eye. How would you characterize um, the UK's attitude now towards FGM? And, and, and uh, you know, we, know we, we see the numbers, the, the, sort of, uh, the sort of official picture that's, that's painted. Politically, things have changed dramatically. I mean, in 2009, actually, I remember with David Cameron, you know, there was a, a a real kind of shift in attitude, which led eventually to you know even more kind of legal uh, uh, legal change. But where would you, how would you characterise the UK and FGM right now? Um, I think we're kind of going backwards in the sense that, like you know, the, like so basically when the number, so what FGM has become has become like you know a buzzword in, ter- in terms of fundraising and all these mm. other kind of conversations. Mm. Do we need to be fundraising in order to end FGM here in the UK? No. Do, do we need to be making sure that social services and, and, and other integral parts of child protection mechanisms ensure that, like, you know, girls who are at risk of FGM are protected? Yes. So I think we're trying to, because we've been so successful in the sense of actually being able to kind of get it onto the legislative kind of um, frameworks and mainstream it, it means that people are now saying, oh, we should be doing things on the community level. FGM has never happened on the community level. It's been, it's been an organized um, crime and it's been something that the state has ignored. There's like a, a hyper sensitivity of not offending people that were basically, again, starting to push young children into um, spaces of real intolerance. And I think that's kind right. of like, you know, massively problematic, especially for for secular Muslim women like myself. Okay. You've done amazing work, Mimko. I mean, on a number of different fronts, um, from, you know, counter-terrorism with the Home Office, you know, DFID, 
the DFID funded kind of anti FGM, you know, social change programs. Um, you stood for parliament once as well, didn't you? I did for the Women's Equality Party. And again, yeah. do you know what? I haven't like, I think that was, I, that's, that, that's the only thing that I would um, put next to um, doing the FGM stuff in terms of like, kind of like, like the vile um, stuff that I got. And really? People, and people could consistently ask me like, would I stand for parliament? And I was like, I really don't want to die. That's my main thing. It's like, it's like if I stood for parliament um, in a, like, you know, in, 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 a, really? non, in a non-Labour seat, because I don't think I, I could, I'd, I'd be able to represent um, the Labour Party as it stands. And I was going to win. I know people would be so threatened about the idea of someone like me surviving everything that I've done and still being able to stand. Really, think, Nimco? Yeah. You, would not do, you would not do that for fear of your, for fear of your life? Yeah, no, definitely. You think that that would be almost an insult too far for those people who hold those, you know, or the views that the the views that how dare I like you know be proud to be Muslim black woman but also not represent the the, the things that they demand me to represent. So I think I think my individuality has has very much like you know irks a lot of people is the sense that like you know like I always said that FGM was meant to break me but it but it kind of made me the loudest person it was something that I wasn't essentially mm. that ashamed of maybe I was scared of the kind of the pushback that I would get but I wasn't very I wasn't embarrassed about the act of FGM because it wasn't something that um I did to myself so yeah no I definitely I definitely like you know I believe like you know I believe in democracy and I believe in politics and like you know I enjoy, I, I enjoy politics but at the same time I also kind of want to stay alive um I don't quite know what to say to that because it's, you know, that's in, in itself is, is sort of evidence that there's crises that you've been through your life are still kind of, you know, on your, on your shoulders. But I, I you know what I would say as well, though, is that you found you're being a member of parliament isn't everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you found, then you found politics isn't everything. You found so many ways to get your message out in such a powerful, in such a powerful and, and constructive way. Um, yeah, I do believe you received you received your OBE in 2019. Uh, a wonderful day for you. How did your family react to to that? It's like you know what it was like. I was having a conversation with with my niece the other day, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to do something. Would you be impressed?" And she's like, "But you've already got an MBM OBE, so you so you've Im, 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 Im impressed me anyway." And for her to say that as a nine year old, I thought, "Oh my god, actually, it does actually really mean something." So it was, uh, like, my sister was excited, my, my niece was excited, my, my mum not so much, because obviously she, she, she wouldn't want me to get an award for doing anything other than talking about my anatomy. Tell, but, me, tell me about that conversation, when you told your mum that you'd got an OBE. Yeah, she was like... What did she, she say to you? She wasn't that interested. She's like, I said, do you want to come? And she said, no. She said, I don't bow down to anybody but God, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to curtsy. I don't think they want you to bow down to them, or whatever, mum. But, yeah, it's, it's like... It's um so that wasn't was, about the queen, was it? It wasn't about the queen, and it was also about the fact that um that I'd got it from for, for something that she actually just thinks is like completely mm. kind of like semi kind of ridiculous in terms of the stuff that I do because like it's not it's not a job that she can tell her parents like what does Nimpo do and she's like I don't know what she does she just lives in London it's her kind of thing. Yeah, well, there's a sadness there, but I mean it's it's. You know what your what, what her what her daughter has done is you know is just almost beyond comprehension. It's um it's also kind of funny in a weird way. Well, but it's just incredible, Nimco. It's an incredible story, and um and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for giving us your time today. It's been an absolute privilege to sit and chat to you about it. Thank you just for being so frank and honest, and and just so incredibly powerful. Um, with your um, with your testimony we really appreciate it uh, we end all our podcasts uh, uh, by asking our guests for their crisis cures so these are three things um, other than another person that kind of help you through um, what would be uh, what would be your first um humor I think fine humor um, yeah. I think that's the kind of like that's that's kind of my my my, my and you, main... and you find humor everywhere I do. I just like you know, and I really, really do find humor in the people um, 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 around me, and it's, it's one of the things. And I also kind of, I think, praying as well, but not praying in the way that is like you know, as in in, in terms of a um, a ritual kind of um, religious thing. But I think I do actually think that the power of manifestation and prayers is like a, it's, it's like a thing. Sometimes I'm I manifest the unnecessary things. So sometimes I'm like 
please let there be a hot guy and a and a black cab that drives past me that I can like that. And sometimes it happens and I just think, damn, why don't I just like pray for something like, you know, manifest something else? So I do actually believe <laughs> in the fact that we can we can manifest um kind of things. So that's my that's my other kind of way of praying in a in a in a weird way. Okay. Um can you give me another crisis cue? Um, Another crisis cue is like I like like there's a um, a really good app called um, Pattern, which is which is about like your star signs and stuff like that. So I do I do like you know I've become more and more kind of really um, connected to the fact that I I think like you know our life parts are kind of charted before our birth in that kind of sense. And sometimes really you're a you're a great believer in fate. I do like great believer in faith and and fate and destiny. Fate destiny um but I, but I but i but i also believe again we, we have the way like I, I don't know it's just like it i like you know on a consistent basis i have moments of deja vu so i also kind of believe in the in the fact that and, and this is the thing about the human spirit is the fact that we, we we actually assume that we're more important than we are rather than just thinking that we're just a grain of sand in a broader kind of conversation and in a broader kind of um, landscape and I really I like you know I really hold true to that I really hold true to the whole point of the fact that I am just a grain of sand and like you know if it's meant to happen it's, it's, it's going to happen that doesn't mean you have to be lazy about it but I think you just have to be not so hard on yourself and and you got one more for me is there a book or a song or uh, or is there a, a, a particular place you go um, I think Spice Girls are always very much fun. I think, again, this is what I mean about somebody that yeah. doesn't, doesn't take themselves seriously. I, I really, really do believe that the Spice Girls were fundamental to my activism in the sense that they were these kind of like really cheapy women that yeah. essentially took on the patriarchy in a different way. So I definitely, definitely, like, you know... Um, like, have, you know you met, have you met them? Have you been able to tell them that? No, I haven't actually. But they're, but they're, but I was I was once um, asked to um, to say what my favorite quote was. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, if you want to be my lover, you've got to get on with my friends. Nimco, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, as a, as I say, a um, yeah, an astonishing story, um, beautifully told. Thank you. Mm-hmm.